The story I'm about to tell is as true as the sky is blue. And even though it happened something like 15 years ago now, I remember every detail flawlessly. I was just a high school dropout doing what it took to make ends meet. No glamour about it. Walmarts used to stay open way after dark, even in the desolate rural areas like I grew up in. I was hired in as some kind of all-around helper, doing anything and everything my bosses told me to. I tell you, I was busting my back. Most of the hours I spent in Walmart, I don't remember. I was working so hard that it all became a blur. Not many memorable occasions, except for one. There's one night I remember like it was yesterday. I'd been assigned to the clothing department for the second half of my shift, and the clock had just hit closing time. I'd spent all day sorting clothes, managing the fitting rooms, and running the register by myself. But it was finally time to start cleaning up and counting the bills in the register. I was right in the middle of counting up all the ones when the man in question stormed up to the counter with a hoodie and a pair of jeans crumbled up in his arms. He was filthy and sweaty from the warm summer night, and his elbows and knees were all scraped up. He had a cross tattoo on his forearm with a bulging vein running across it, and he wore the most raggedy stained white tank top and shorts. He threw the clothes on the counter and demanded to buy them. Hey mister, I need to buy these clothes, alright? I got the money. I couldn't help but roll my eyes. He made me lose track of the number I was on. I'm sorry sir, but I just started counting the money in the register. I can't make any more transactions here. You'll have to go up to the front. You should hurry before they start closing. I don't have time for that! I need to buy these here! Now! I'm in a rush! I got a little freaked out by how suddenly his demeanor changed. I'd been working in that Walmart for long enough. I knew better than to aggravate a customer like him any further. So even though it was against policy, I rang him up with the about $300 in untraceable cash sitting right behind the counter. The man handed me a torn and crumpled $20 bill, leaving him about $3 short. I gave him an apprehensive look, but decided to just accept it and make up the difference later with some change out of my own pocket. I would normally never do that, but honestly, I felt a little bad for the guy. He looked a lot rougher than most of the customers I saw on a daily basis, and that's saying something. As soon as I gave him back the clothes, he ripped off the tags and put the jeans and hoodie on right over the clothes he was wearing. It was nighttime, but it was still over 80 degrees outside, which made that action a little strange to me. But by then, it was too late. Without a word, he ran out of the store. I tried my best to get the encounter out of my mind, but it was no use. Barely 10 minutes later, a whole army of cop cars came barreling into the parking lot. They locked down the entire Crossroads Plaza and came in questioning everybody in the store. They told everyone they were looking for a convicted killer who'd escaped from prison and was on the run. And when they gave the man's description, I kicked myself. The fugitive is a white male, late 40s, wearing a white tank top and shorts. He has a cross tattoo on his arm. If you believe you have seen this man, Please come forward. I had no choice but to give them a statement. I let them know he'd hassled me at the register and changed his clothes. They had me come with them to check the store's security cameras. I was extremely embarrassed, especially when the police saw how many breaks I gave the guy. But at least they were able to confirm that he was indeed the man they were looking for. To this day, I feel guilty about that night. I played in my head over and over again looking for ways I could have played my cards more responsibly. I can't shake the thought that if I'd just stalled him for a few more minutes, or if I'd stood my ground about store policy and made him go up to the front, maybe he would have been caught. I'm always baffled that he didn't steal the wad of cash I left sitting right in front of his eyes. I know he must have been tempted, but he probably thought better of it. The worst part is, after all these years, that man is still on the loose. But when I get too down on myself for all that, there's one thing I can remember that makes me feel a little better about myself. A few nights later, while that guy was still all over the news, the story broke out that the fugitive, some guy by the name of Richard, had actually been stopped by the police on his very first day on the run. But he somehow convinced the cop that he was a jogger. A jogger on the hottest day of the year. I may have been reckless, but that cop who stopped him and let him walk was just plain stupid.
You live around here, buddy? Where you, what's your address? I don't have an address. What is? We got an escapee. Where from? A prison. Prison here? No, no you prison. know the bad thing about it? What's that? You'll match it up to him. That sucks, doesn't it? Do jog again in the future. Carry some ID with you. All right. That's hey. our quick line there. Hey, have a good day now. When I was still in college, I worked part-time at the local Walmart to make ends meet. Nowadays, I'm extremely grateful that my degree has kept me employed in a more respectable career, because I almost didn't make it out of my time at Walmart alive. I remember one night in particular, when the danger came to a head. It was a Friday. I was taking a few hours to catch up on my studying before going out for the night, but I got a call from my manager. Hey, Sally. We need you to come into work tonight. Miriam didn't show up again. <sighs> All right. I'll be there in an hour. It seemed like that there had been a lot of no-call, no-shows recently. I certainly didn't appreciate losing my night out to a late shift at work, but more than that, I didn't want to be the type of person that left their workplace short-staffed. That being said, I could already feel myself getting closer and closer to that point. The turnover was high, for a good reason. The pay was minimum wage, and management was always taking advantage of the people who didn't walk out the door. People like me. When I showed up at around 9, I was glad to see that it was a slow night for a Friday. Back when I was working there, Walmart used to stay open far later than it does today. I could see why they made the decision to change their hours. I only saw about a dozen cars in the entire parking lot, and most of the customers were already checking out. Still, I was pretty sour about the whole thing. It wasn't like I was getting paid overtime for this. The next several hours dragged on uneventfully, until finally my manager made the closing announcement. Attention valued Walmart customers, the store is now closing. Please finish shopping and make your way to the checkout lanes. Thank you, and have a safe night. The way he delivered that announcement, you'd think he was a nice guy, but he was only that way to the customers, not with the employees. I checked out my last customer and was about to walk out the door for the night when he yelled at me. Hey Sally, where do you think you're going? Uh, I'm going home? I just clocked out. No, you're not. Miriam's shift was eight to close, so that means you're going to help close the store. <sighs> Alright, what do you need me to do? Well, for starters, walk around all the aisles and make sure all the customers are on their way out. You got it, boss. The store was probably all but empty by the time he made his announcement. I didn't see anybody until I got to the electronics section. But of course, when it's the dead hours of the morning and you're trying to close so you can go home and get some sleep, the one person left in the store is always the one person who gives the most trouble. He was just some old fat guy staring at the wall of TVs. At first, I thought it was strange that he could be fixated on the same minute-long action movie preview that constantly plays on the TVs, but... I quickly realized that somehow there was something else playing on the one he was staring into. I approached him slowly. Excuse me, sir. The store is closed. You'll have to leave and come back to buy that tomorrow. He didn't answer to me. He didn't even move or blink or give any indication that he was aware of my presence. Sir? Would you mind coming back tomorrow? Not a single muscle twitched. He was engrossed into whatever he was watching, but I was ready to go home. Sir, the store is closed. If you stay any longer, you will be trespassing. Just a moment, Sally. I'm watching my favorite horror film. <gasps> I gasped. I had no idea he knew my name. I had already clipped off my name tag when I'd clocked out a few minutes before then. Maybe he'd heard my manager yelling at me. Get out or I'm calling the cops! He stared me down with the smuggest of looks, then finally turned and walked away. I let out a sigh of relief. <sighs> with him gone, there was nobody left in the store. 
so I went ahead and started shutting down the television displays. I began with the TV that the creepy old fat guy was enthralled with. I only glanced at the screen enough to realize that there was some sadistic gore movie playing on it, not something management would be okay with. I quickly reached behind the TV and ejected the disc he'd left. It was a blank disc, home burnt, with the date written on it with a sharpie. It was dated two days before that night. I pocketed the disc and went back to work until I was finally allowed to go home. But when I plopped down on my couch, I couldn't relax. Something was lingering in the back of my mind. So I fished the disc out of my work pants and fed it into my DVD player. Immediately, my heart sank. There was no Hollywood reject. It was a homemade recording. And there were no actors. Only real people in mortal peril. A real life snuff film. And the unwilling stars were my co-workers. I watched in petrified horror as the girls I thought had skipped out on work were tied up, tortured, brutalized, and eventually executed on camera. And at the end, the eyes of Miriam pleaded through the screen for help, but her mouth was taped shut. The things that man did to those girls, I... I just can't even talk about it anymore. I'm sorry. It makes me sick to my stomach. And even after all these years, I'm still so paranoid that I'd run into trouble on my way home from work one night and never show up again. Who was that man? And why did he even have the nerve to play this disc at the Walmart that was supplying his victims? I panicked. I quit the next day and never looked back. I also reported the disc to the police, but nothing ever came out of it. Every night, I contemplate whether I was next. After all, he knew my name. I used to work at a Walmart before I got fired for a headphone-related incident. I worked in the clothing department. And since Walmart isn't exactly known for its hot fashion, it was generally pretty slow. Aside from folding and hanging up clothes, there wasn't much else to do. That's why I picked up the habit of hiding my AirPods behind my hair and listening to music to get through the boredom of my shifts. I was fully aware that this was against company policy, but I didn't really care. I would have quit from the lack of stimulation alone if it weren't for my music. And it wasn't like my supervisor was around much anyway. I don't think they ever would have known if it weren't for the major incident which got me fired. The day started like any other. I finished the task left over from the previous shift and got settled into my usual spot by the fitting rooms, folding the same 10 articles of clothing over and over again while tucked into a corner in which I'd only be seen by customers who were already in the fitting room aisle. It took almost an hour before I got my first customer. Hello sir, I'd like to try on these clothes please. He had about five or six articles of clothing, so I handed him a tag numbered six and pointed him down the aisle as I gave him my usual customer service voice. All the rooms are available. Hang this outside your door to let others know your room is occupied. Well, thank you very much. After waiting a few seconds for a response he didn't get, he gave up and took the first door on the left. Even on slow days, the business came in waves, so it wasn't more than a minute later before the next customer approached me. At a glance, I could tell there was something a little off about the guy. He didn't seem like the type of person that would usually buy clothes, like at all. But it didn't matter to me. I treat all customers with the same level of hospitality. None. Can I get in one of those rooms? The guy had far more than 10 articles of clothing, which is the limit per customer. But there was no way I was going to argue with him over it. So I just handed him a tag number 10 and sent him on his way away from me. All the rooms except the first one on the left are available. Hang this outside your door to let others know your room is occupied. He took the tag slowly, like he wasn't sure if it was some kind of trap or not. Then, he went into the second room on the left. I knew that was weird, because most people would put a little more space between themselves and the people changing next to them. 
The fitting rooms were more like stalls. The walls don't go all the way down to the floor and they don't reach the ceiling. But there was nothing I was willing to do about it. That alone was not a good enough reason to interrupt somebody while they were changing. So I just went back to folding, waiting for them to come out and give me more clothes to fold. A few minutes in, my favorite song came on shuffle. I discreetly turned the volume up a few notches, just to jam out a little bit for the one song. Then I turned it back down so I could hear new customers approaching. That's when the weird guy came out. I thought it was strange how he came out before the other guy, considering he had so much more clothes. He had all the clothes jumbled up into one tangled mess which he plopped down on the cart in front of me. Thank you, have a blessed day. He sounded out of breath, like he'd just done a fitting room speed run. He gave me a good look at the bloodshot white of his eyes, then tore his gaze away and walked off in a rush. I shrugged. Oh well, just another day of dealing with Walmart shoppers. But as I was folding up the clothes he just dropped off, I noticed something I'd never seen before, not even at Walmart. There were bloodstains smeared all over the clothes, little ones at first, just an eye-catching dab or two, then more and more towards the bottom until the last shirt was nearly soaked in red. I began to panic, pausing my music to hear my quickened breath. I put aside the clothes and walked down the aisle. The number six tag was still hanging on the first door, and beneath it, a thick pool of blood seeping out into the aisle. I pushed open the door, revealing the source. The nice man from before was stuffed into the corner with his face torn to shreds, skin hanging off the bone, his half-naked body full of deep holes still spilling out with blood. The blood was everywhere, and on the mirror, a message had been written in it by hand, the writer's fingerprints visible in the coagulation. The parting words of the killer read, The devil made me do it. Needless to say, I got fired that day, but I don't care. I don't even care that they caught the guy the same day. All I can think about when I remember that day is, how could I have let it happen? If I'd just been doing my job, if I'd only been paying just one little bit of attention, I could have heard that man being murdered. Maybe then, I could have done something to stop it. Maybe I could have intervened or screamed or something. I could have done anything to save that man's life, but no, I wasn't doing any of those things. I was lost in my own little world within my airpods, and that man is dead because of me. Worse, he's more than dead. Ah!